Uh, hello and, and welcome to our year end 2022 and Outlook 2023 Functional GI Trends webinar. On behalf of Commonwealth Diagnostics International and My Total Health, we are excited to gather for the third year in a row to help break down timely themes, hot topics, and new research discussed during this year's annual ACG scientific meeting. Uh, just a little about our, our hosts and sponsors for today. CDI's mission is to help providers better identify and diagnose common sources of digestive distress and functional GI illness with a focus on developing a portfolio of non-invasive and cost-effective diagnostic tools that help result in expedited treatment, better patient outcomes, and a robust cost savings for the healthcare delivery system. And My Total Health, powered by its My GI Health platform and data aggregation technology, provides GI-focused industry solutions, including patient provider engagement tools for GI practices, patient-driven marketing and sales solutions for healthcare brands, and subject recruitment and enrollment services for academic researchers, industry sponsors, and GI clinicians. Um, now, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, today's panel discussion is being recorded and we will have make it available to the GI community following uh, today's event. Uh, if you do have any questions during the panel discussion, please feel free to type them into the chat box um, or Q&A in the Zoom control panel. We will try to cover as many questions as possible uh, during the discussion and the Q&A at the end today. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's panel. Uh, Craig Strasnick is a seasoned executive, experienced entrepreneur, and dynamic commercial leader. He currently serves as the president and CEO of CDI and is a board member for Functional Gut Diagnostics, a joint uh, partnership in the UK. Uh, My Total Health, which is developer of the My GI Health platform, and GI Logic Inc., creator of Abstats, a non-invasive GI biosensor device. Craig, it's great to have you here today, and I will leave it to you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jason. As always, thank you to you and your team for putting together another great event tonight and to our panelists, as well as members of the audience. We thank you very much for being here and joining us tonight. I'm really looking forward to tonight's event. This, as Jason uh, mentioned, is our fifth webinar event since we started the series. We've only seen the number of attendants continue to grow since that time. The feedback after each one of these events has been tremendously encouraging. So we're appreciative of everyone's continued participation and support in these programs. Uh, tonight, the intention is going to be to kind of purposely keep this one a little bit more conversational, treat it uh, more of a, a fluid kind of roundtable discussion. So as Jason also mentioned, I definitely encourage the audience to please, if you'd like to, be as interactive as, as possible and use the chat function to ask questions whenever they may pop up. We'll try to uh, get to each one and uh, everyone live. And if we don't, then we'll most certainly follow up with you in due time uh, afterward or in a timely fashion, I should say, uh, to make sure your question does get answered. We also had some really great questions pre-submitted uh, from our attendees tonight. So we're very grateful for that as well. And we'll make sure to incorporate in uh, as many of those questions to tonight's conversation as well. So I think uh, what I'll do is I'll begin with our panelist introductions and bios, and then we can start by having each of our panelists give their Kind of over our overarching perspective on on current trends and functional GI coming out of ACG and, and going into the new year, and then from there we can kind of open the discussion up and, and begin asking some more specific questions about uh, each panelist's relative areas of of interest. So, with that, it's my pleasure to begin by introducing Dr. Brennan Spiegel. Uh, Dr. Spiegel is the director of health services research for Cedar Sinai Health System and the founding director of the Cedar Sinai Master's Degree Program in Health Delivery Science. He also serves as Cedar Sinai site director for the Clinical and Translational Science Institute and is assistant dean for the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Dr. Spiegel, welcome. Thanks for having uh, Dr. me. Absolutely. Dr. Rajiv Sharma is a world-renowned board-certified integrative gastroenterologist, national speaker, writer, author, health media expert, media correspondent, and entrepreneur. He is founder of Digestive Health Associates and the Sharma Center in Terre Haute, Indiana. He's the owner of the nutritional supplement company, Dr. Gut Happiness, and author of the book, Pursuit of Gut Happiness, a guide for using probiotics to achieve optimal health. He is also the chief of GI at Wellington Medical Center in Florida, an advisor to multiple health tech companies and global investment funds. Dr. Sharma, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. 
Dr. John Damianos is an internal medicine resident at Yale New Haven Hospital and pursuing the clinical educator distinction. He is a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Alliance for Education on Probiotics and has research interests on the gut-brain axis, gut microbiome, and diet and nutrition therapies for functional GI disorders. Dr. Damianos is also a social media uh, extraordinaire and actively involved in sharing the latest research and clinical best practices through his Twitter channel, which I and everyone else at CDI follows very, very closely. And we thank you for that, Dr. Damiano. So thank you for, for being here. Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, absolutely. So uh, why don't we get right into it? And um, maybe what I can do is kind of circle back and, and go in sequential order and uh, begin with with you, Dr. Spiegel. I know you've, you've been a part of these trends and uh, trends webinars, I should say, uh, with us for the past several years, including our, our mid-year webinar following DDW. So um, can you maybe kick us off here and, and tell us uh, what you think has, has maybe changed in the industry since that time and, and what topics you've been following uh, most closely over these past several months and, and throughout the ACG meeting and, and beyond? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, Craig, and thanks to the panelists and for the opportunity to be with you guys this evening, uh, for which I'm sure will be a fruitful and interesting discussion. So, you know, I've been really following a number of different trends in digestive health in general, but I think they all kind of fall under an umbrella, which increasingly is sort of non-pharmacological treatments. Now, that's not to say that pharmacological treatments are not extremely useful and important, and there are some interesting and important updates we can talk about in terms of pharmacotherapeutics for functional GI disorders. Now we call those disorders of gut-brain interaction. But I've also been interested in a number of emerging um, kind of, well, maybe in the past we would have called them alternative treatments, but they're becoming much more mainstream and evidence-based. Everything from diet, which we'll talk about perhaps today, you know, Dr. Raj has a lot of interest in that, um, to um, something I think a lot about, which is virtual reality and sort of behavioral interventions. We now have uh, availability of FDA cleared apps. Uh, for example, uh, Mahana is an app that we're hearing a lot about. By the way, I have no relationship with the company, just um, for what it's worth, we're hearing a lot more about digital uh, technologies that can support our patients. Um, and you know, even exercise um, and yoga and some of these traditional therapies that are evidence-based, but are not always thought about. And so I've been interested more and more in, in these trends. And when I go to meetings like the ACG meeting, those are some of the, the posters and sessions that I'm, I'm kind of most interested in. And then, of course, there are, you know, some hybrid interventions, like uh, we might talk about the, this new vibrating capsule that you swallow. So it's like a pill, but there's no actual molecule in it, or at least no therapeutic molecule, right? Uh, it's a vibrating pill. So these are all examples of new kinds of therapies that are evidence-based, but maybe when we went to medical school, we hadn't thought a lot about these kinds of interventions. So that's sort of my opening salvo, and I'm sure we can unpack some of that as we continue to discuss. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I mean, this this entire kind of biopsychosocial approach and some of the alternative therapies like the gut-directed psychotherapies and cognitive, behavior, cognitive behavioral therapy and, and some of the, the bio feedback functions and, and the like um, are all tremendously important. You know, the, the functional GI patient is is not one size fits all, as we all know, and, and there needs to be a multitude of, of means of diagnosis, treatment, and, and management to make sure that uh, that each case is value driven. So um, no, I, I appreciate those those insights. And uh, Dr. Damianos, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to you next. Any uh, updates in, in functional GI, IBS treatment, uh, probiotics, prebiotics, I know is, is an area of specific uh, interest for, for you. Anything coming out of ACG that, that piqued your interest uh, most specifically? Absolutely. So one of my main interests is microbiome targeted therapeutics. And that's obviously an umbrella term for many different types of therapies that include diet, antibiotics, probiotics, fecal microbiota transplantation. And then something that's very exciting that there were a few talks about and, and a few posters as well at ACG are live biotherapeutics, which are can be thought of essentially as pharmacologic grade probiotics. And the FDA is slated to 
vote for approval of, of the first live biotherapeutic for the prevention of recurrent C. difficile infections. And so that's, that's certainly very interesting. There's also tremendous work being done looking at fecal microbiota transplantations for conditions such as immune checkpoint inhibitor related colitis as immune checkpoint inhibitors are used increasingly in the cancer directed therapy world. But thinking specifically in the disorders of gut-brain interaction, something that I've had my eye on for quite some time is further refining our understanding of irritable bowel syndrome. And I think we've made enormous strides over the years, whereas before it was a, a very nebulous concept. More recently, we've stratified people into more constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, or mixed type pictures. But now we are understanding more and more about pathophysiologic components that play into each individual's experience of IBS type symptoms. And, and just as you said, Craig, not uh, there's no one size fits all for disorders of gut brain interaction. We often say that when you see one IBS patient, you see one IBS patient. And, and there's actually an excellent paper that just came out in the past few weeks in gut written, uh, the first author is Dr. Michael Camilleri from uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, talking about how we can better appreciate some of these unique pathophysiologic contributors to IBS. And there were some very interesting posters that I'm happy to, to talk about and, and go into further that identify some of these unique contributors and encourage all of us in the GI community to think about these as, as either mimics of IBS, things that we, we patients may have been diagnosed with IBS, but it's actually due to these other things, or patients may have different contributors to their experience of IBS as well. So that's something that, that, that I'm uh, very excited about about. As am I. I appreciate those those insights. Uh, Dr. Spiegel, this is something that you and I have talked uh, many, many times in that length about over the years, um, but it, it's something that's very near and dear to, to my my heart and, and all of ours at, at CDI. Um, you know, I, I really do think this idea of what was functional GI, and Dr. Spiegel, again, to your, your point, what is uh, now being termed uh, DGBI, disorders of gut brain, interaction, but really more broadly than that, pathophysiologic disturbances versus anatomic abnormalities. I think for a, a really long time, it's just been, you know, if it if it's not structural, if it's not anatomic, if you can't see it, you know, it doesn't necessarily exist. And um, I, I think the idea of pathophysiologic disturbances and, and treating the DGBI uh, patient with uh, a, a lot more focused and, and precision-based approaches, individualized approaches, um, it is starting to really uh, take off and is really, really important. You know, you could have 10 IBS patients in a room, uh, physical or, or virtual for, for that matter. Um, and, and there could be, you know, seven, six or seven under underlying causes uh, for, for those patients' uh, irritable bowel syndrome diagnosis. So um, really being able to get down in a precision-based way and, and uh, determining what the underlying etiology is and then dictating a, a treatment and management plan versus uh, what has historically been kind of the the vice versa uh, approach to that and kind of the rule out diagnosis and taking over the counter medications or three or four other medications or dietary approaches, wherever the case may be, without having a, a, a true underlying uh, fundamental understanding of what the pathogenesis is of that disease. Um, I, you know, I, I think we're getting to a place where there's technologies out there that exist that are allowing us to be able to do that on a case by case basis. And it's, it's tremendously exciting. So um, thank you for that. And I, I completely agree. It's an area that, that I personally am also excited about. Um, Dr. Sharma, I will, I will turn it over to you. I know you, uh, didn't get a chance to attend ACG this year, but followed along very closely nonetheless. And I know that some areas that are very near and dear to your heart are, uh, some of the cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapies, uh, some FODMAP diets and just kind of dietary manipulation in, in general, uh, probiotics as well. So if, if you want to maybe touch on some of the, the technologies and, and treatments that are, uh, of most interest to you. And, and then I, I have a follow-up question for you after that, based on an interview you did with Beckers earlier this year, where you referred to uh, wanting or desiring to turn your practice into a Starbucks experience was, I believe, uh, the, the quote from the Beckers article. And I, I would love to dig into that a little bit more and and, and understand exactly what you, you mean by that. Sure. Well, absolutely. Well, thank you again. It's always a pleasure to be part of this panel. See, I, I come from a country 
that invented yoga, meditation, relaxation, right? I mean, India, I mean, I was born there, very thankful to have that perspective on health and healing. So in my book, IBS is a, is a condition that affects your gut, brain, and your mind. So I call that the gut, brain, and mind axis. It's, it, it's a trifecta that you got to work on. So with gut, you know, again, that includes the muscles and everything else in it. So FODMAPs and any type of a pro-inflammatory molecules like polyol, the sugar alcohols, they have a big role in, in symptomatology. So we have to manipulate that to get people better. Then coming to, you know, brain, again, you know, the gut-brain axis, you know, hypersensitivity and things like that, you have to keep that in mind. But for me personally, growing up in our culture and learning American way of practicing medicine and GI and looking at what India has done for thousands of years with yoga, Ayurveda, everything else, and meditation, I, I feel that there's a big potential to manipulate the mind to really help with IBS. And that's where your relaxation techniques and that's where Dr. Spiegel's VR for relaxation will come into play. Where if we can manipulate the mind, I feel we can change the whole, whole game here because we know the mind over matter. If you, I, mean, I don't want to go into spirituality too much, but I do feel that there is a spiritual angle and there is a meditative angle to IBS. And we have not tapped into that much yet, but I feel as a practitioner in 2022, anybody coming out of fellowship, residency, medical school, I feel they need to look at a holistic way, which is you look at the complementary things, which we call complementary, I feel it's going to become mainstream. And I feel the medicines will become complementary. So we'll be prescribing yoga plus hot yoga plus 30 minutes of massage every other day, heart stone massage plus VR plus uh, probiotics, which I am a big fan of, you know, personally, I take them myself every other day. And then uh, eating the right amount of diet, the Mediterranean food, Indian food, depending what food you can consume without too much toxins in the food. I feel that would be the front. And then number two option would be, well, now we're going to complement that with, you know, lubiprostone and other brands which may work. So I feel that's, I, this, that's the way I practice. And, you know, a lot of times people have other, you know, even with IBD, they always have an IBS component, you know, with functional dyspepsia, there's always a layer of brain gut axis and mind. So I always try to identify the mind angle first and approach everything with that approach. And then, it, then I kind of tailor my treatment accordingly. And of course, it also helps with the patient being open to it. And especially now I'm seeing in private practice, the new generation, the, the the Gen Zers, you know, the millennials and and people with, you know, with access to TikTok and social media, all these guys, uh, they are very open to new ideas versus some of my, you know, I don't want to say the word older, but some of the elderly patients who don't have their perspective that you can look at other things, you know, labeled as complementary so far, you know, like yoga, meditation, and relaxation, etc. So I feel... Personally, I'm very satisfied with the newer generation because they actually are open to my ideas and open to engagement, which makes it fun to get them better. And also from from practice standpoint, now you have a committed patient. So it's satisfying to you in, in every way. No, I, I think uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. And it's an integrated approach to the functional GI patient, which is tremendously important. And, and there's a lot of compelling literature out there that that supports that position, even things like diaphragmatic breathing and the like, and and how that's had a favorable effect on quality of life for for patients living with IBS. So I think it's tremendously important, and I I also kind of hear a, a, an emerging theme here, which is is kind of meeting the the functional GI patient where they are. This is something we talk a lot about at CDI. It's evident in the products and services that that were offering our our diagnostic test can be taken uh, at home by the patient not doesn't necessarily have to be administered in a provider's office uh, my total health or my GI health the the um, app based technology that uh, CDI is, is currently managing is is built uh, you know kind of 
out of the idea that 15 minutes at intake with a GI provider just isn't enough. And there needs to be a lot uh, more opportunity for continued interaction and, and chronic care management for these patients. Because once you identify that they have, say, IBS, um, you know, that most certainly is not the end of the road. It's only the beginning. So um, I think maybe just generally, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of go back uh Again, in the same order, I'll start with you, Dr. Spiegel, um, because I know that that VR is something that um, is is uh, so close to to your domain and and what you're most focused on, and uh, really is uh, a solution here to maybe that unmet need to being able to get to the patient in a way that doesn't necessarily mandate they're having to come uh, to the office in order to identify, diagnose, and, and treat a, a functional GI disorder. Um, so maybe just generally, and then more specifically, getting into some of the uh, approaches with, with BR, like the cognitive behavioral therapy, the gut-directed psychotherapies, the biofeedback loops, um, but then even in just more generally drug intervention, dietary manipulation, other lifestyle changes, uh, like Raj was talking about, uh, you know, even meditation, yoga, um, you know, how do we centralize all that and how do we individualize it to uh, get to the patient when they need it? Because most times when you all are talking to them, uh, you know, they're not symptomatic. Um, you know, they, they need support uh, when they're not in front of you and, and can't interact live with, with their healthcare provider. Yeah, thanks. Well, there's a lot in there. And, and I just want to start by um, agreeing with Raj and his comments and maybe adding my own perspective on that. And then perhaps that will help put interventions like VR into a broader context. And so, you know, I was a philosophy major and uh, like all philosophy majors, we studied Rene Descartes, who in the mid 1600s, you know, proposed this idea of dualism, that the mind and the body were separate and distinct, right? And we have this material body that ports around this immaterial mind it turns out that's just wrong, completely wrong, but it still to this day infects the way we think about, you know, biomedical sciences, clinical medicine. We think about the brain as sort of the domain of the psychiatrist, supratentorial, we talk about it. And then there's the rest of the body where like the real doctors do their work. Well, it could not be farther from the truth. In fact, the, uh, the, you need bones and tendons and muscles to have thoughts in your brain. Like literally, you can't just take your brain and float it in a vat this whole part that's outside of the brain is the brain. It's just the part of the brain that's not confined to the skull. It is the part of the brain that senses the world around us and the world within us to inform this part of our body about what's happening. But it's all one contigu contiguous system. And so if you think about this, even embryologically for a second, okay, if you remember from, and, and, you know, there's the endoderm, there's the mesoderm, there's the ectoderm. These are three layers that define us as human beings and they co-evolve together, completely intermeshed. And so what we see in IBS is the endoderm is the intestinal system and it has its own sensory functions. It has its own luminal activities with interacting with microbiome. It has its, you know, its own support systems like the, that is from the mesoderm. Okay. This is all the, the, the mesentery and the tendons and ligaments that are all tied up, holding up this sack of potatoes that we're destined to carry around our entire lives, all right? Managing gravity and the pull of gravity. And so we have all these support systems that can, things can go wrong there too. Think about, you know, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or, or hyper uh, flexible joints where people have stretchy uh, mesentery, then they get bacterial overgrowth. But then we have the ectoderm, okay, where the nervous system invests itself within all of those systems and then connects up to the brain centrally. And then it goes back and forth with the neuroendocrine systems and so on. So what I'm getting at here is we have to think about something like IBS and many other conditions, by the way, with that in mind. We have to think about when we talk about the gut brain axis, I'm thinking about it that way. How can we manipulate the luminal content? in a way that's positive and supportive? How can we uh, affect the motor function of the intestinal system so that it can literally fight gravity and pump against this force that we're all enmeshed in our entire lives from the moment that we're conceived to the day we die? We have to think about how we can moderate the um, serotonin systems, which not only affect the motility of the gut, but also uh, the sensitivity of the nerves themselves. How do we then change the way the brain has experienced this bombardment of signals coming up from, uh, from the gut itself? This is where something like virtual reality has a huge role. 
we absolutely can change the brain. And what I mean by that, and I'll stop talking here in a second, is the brain is not like a block of Play-Doh that sits haplessly in our skull. It is a shape-shifting organ like any other organ in our body. It can change its form and our function. And you may have inherited a body that's betrayed you. You may have inherited a body that we can't exactly fix through surgery or medication, but we can change the way the brain experiences that body. Literally, that's what CBD does. And I mean, literally, it changes the form and the function of the brain. It takes eight to 12 weeks of work to do that. It will literally change the way the brain connects within itself and the HPA axis, cortisol, stress hormone levels, and all the downstream inflammatory and immune responses of that circular system. VR is a way to plug this part of it to literally change the way the brain is operating, not immediately in 15 minutes, but over the course of eight weeks, we use a treatment course called IBS VR, which is a program that we developed and are testing now. We're comparing whether it can help augment the effects of serotonergic agents um, or whether you need any medications at all to, uh, to reduce the symptoms. So we're actually doing multi-stage studies right now, looking at VR plus medication, VR alone and just versus medication alone um, in like a three-arm study to figure these things out. And we also have a variety of NIH funded studies looking at VR um, be, uh, for a variety of other forms of pain. So I've just said a mouthful and I'll stop there, um, but just sort of my perspective, big picture on what we're talking about here. Yeah, no, I think, listen, if you talk to from a patient's perspective, I think this work is tremendously important. If you talk to someone with IBS, the normal course of their day, the fact is, is, is very much different compared to someone who does not or has not been diagnosed with IBS. Things like frequency, urgency, and complete evacuation, they infringe upon the normal course of daily activity for an IBS sufferer. Those things are real. Um, and I think it goes back to this idea of, of individualizing uh, the identification, diagnosis, management and, and treatment um, of the underlying cause. And um, I guess, you know, on that note, I'll, I'll turn this one over uh, to you, Dr. Damianos, because I, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, the paper in gut, I saw that, uh, that paper by Dr. Camilleri. Um, and I, I thought it was fascinating and, and very much true, you know, uh, things like evacuation, disorders, dysmotility, visceral hypersensitivity, uh, you know, barrier dysfunction, dysbiosis or SIBO, um, you know, those are all very different things. They need to be addressed differently. They need to be managed and approached differently. And each one of those cases ultimately needs to be treated differently and will get resolved with varying time horizons. Some will be, you know, quick and easy. Others will be long and difficult and others will be somewhere in the middle. And there's just no way to really, uh, you know, determine with any conformity how that's going to apply, uh, you know, across a vast patient population. It, it just, it needs to be individualized a little bit more. So um, there's a question here, which uh, is, you know, is there, is there anything that you're uh, doing currently or any technologies or, or uh, you know, management approaches that you were uh, using to oversee some of these functional GI patients, I guess, first to identify what that underlying uh, cause of their IBS may be, and then uh, to kind of manage them over the, the long term with some sort of chronic care management approach that allows you to maintain a, a level of engagement interaction with them, even if they're not necessarily you know, presenting to your office uh, every Wednesday of the week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And thank you for that question, because it is so important. And this is relevant to even if you're looking at trials for any particular intervention in IBS, whether it's a dietary intervention, a, a probiotic, a medication, you'll typically see that patients will respond 30, 40% will, will have good response. Uh, there'll be uh, differences between placebo and then the rest of the patients have no response to that intervention. And why, why is that? Well, it's because of the heterogeneous nature of IBS. And there are some people who are going to have more of a dysbiosis component. They may have had recurrent courses of antibiotics, so they may have predisposing factors for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so they're going to respond more to these luminal-based therapies that target their dysbiosis. Whereas there might be a completely different patient. You brought up evacuation disorders. I think this is a, a fantastic example. And so these are typically patients who are diagnosed with constipation or chronic idiopathic constipation, constipation 
estrogen predominant IBS, they're given laxatives and secretagogues and multiple agents. And how I explain it to, to patients is if you're sick of hearing me talk and you want to you know, push me out of the door right, right behind me, you can push until your lips turn blue, but you're not going to get me out until you open the door. And, and so we need to target that underlying problem. And so we need to treat them with pelvic floor physical therapy or biofeedback. I was fortunate to collaborate with a, a group in Spain that researches abnormal reflexes between the diaphragm and the abdominal wall, resulting in what's called abdominophrenic dyssynergia, which is emerging as an important pathophysiologic mechanism underlying bloating and distension in disorders of gut brain interaction, including functional dyspepsia, IBS, and functional bloating and, and distension. And this is really a, a, a disconnect in the brain gut axis that can be corrected through biofeedback. And there are other patients who have bile acid malabsorption. There were some very interesting case reports and reviews at ACG looking at rare conditions like uh, hereditary alpha tryptosemia syndrome, which is a, a, an autosomal dominant genetic condition that causes IBS-like symptoms, flushing, dysautonomia, uh, disaccharidase, disaccharidase deficiencies. There was a, a paper from Michigan or an abstract from Michigan that showed that uh, over 36% of, of people with IBS may have at least one disaccharidase deficiency. And so really keeping all of these, the, the sort of more common ones and the rarer ones in our minds is extremely important. And, and in internal medicine, there, there's always a, a, a huge emphasis on the importance of the, the history and the physical examination. There's often an, an old quote attributed to one of the greats of medicine saying, if, if you talk to the patient, if you listen to the patient, they'll tell you what they have. They'll tell you what's going on. And really a lot of things in the history can help. Endometriosis is another great example that came up a lot during ACG of, of, of these uh, women patients who are having uh, symptoms that correlate with menses. And so really taking thorough histories, thorough physical exams, and then using your history and examination to guide specific diagnostic tools like breath testing for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or uh, anal rectal physiology testing, looking for evacuation disorders, even looking at uh, disaccharidase deficiencies on, on uh, uh, biopsy, that looking with history and examination, we can identify the risk factors and the patterns that tell us which of these are, are more likely. And some patients may have overlapping things too. I'll, I'll just finish with one other abstract from ACG that looked at an association between evacuation disorders and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And there was a strong association there. And that may be one of the reasons that SIBO tends to be so recurrent in these patients is we can treat the, the overgrowth in the acute setting, but if we're not correcting the underlying problem, which is the dyssynergic defecation, the pelvic floor disorder, then we're just going to have recurrence after recurrence. So good histories, good physical, and then targeted diagnostics to lead to individualized therapies. Incredibly, incredibly insightful. I couldn't agree more. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head there and and you plucked the, the thought that I was having uh, right out of my head. Just, to, you know, it's not to say that there is not comorbidity embedded throughout here and, and the same patient could have an underlying condition that is creating a, a multitude of different symptoms, um, or they could have more than one condition that is contributing to those symptoms. But, uh, you know, more often than not, you're not going to find one without the other. So if you're treating anything, uh, empirically, um, you know, you're, you're lessening, uh, the chance of having a, a successful outcome. So, you know, being precision and, and, uh, personalized is important here. Dr. Sharma, any thoughts on this topic generally uh, before I, I think we'll um, get into a few of the specific questions that were, were pre-submitted uh, by the audience. Okay. And I'm not going to let you get out of that that uh, Starbucks comment. Comment about Starbucks, Starbucks in the Becker's article either. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, again, uh, again, a very insightful comment so far. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to second what Brennan had said about uh uh, you know, uh, you know, just the, the the mind, the body, and everything else. And I've been dying to make this comment. I'm so glad you know we are on the same page in this panel. Uh, you know, when I look at a patient, when I look at any human body, 
I feel we are all affected by electromagnetic forces, all right? So don't take me as a crazy scientist here, but we are we are electromagnetic beings. So as we look at, you know, metaphysics and biology and theology and everything else you can think of, you cannot have a universe without mind entering into it. So the mind can shape the universe. So E is equal to MC squared, MC squared is equal to E. So if you go into mass and energy and light and matter, this way I feel opens up a big field of intervention of mind therapy. So not only this will apply to IBS and anything which has uh, irritable mind or IMS, irritable mind syndrome, I feel that'd be a good part of healing our patients. And this new ge generation of patients, they're looking at, more, I want to say, more comprehensive answers. And a lot of times when I'm trying to push patients, not push, shall I say, suggest, hey, do, do you want to try, you know, uh, Amitiza or Linzess? You know, I mean, what do you want to try? They always say, do you have something which is non-medical first? And especially younger patients are, are asking for those options. So in that case, I'm having to go through their, you know, their, their medication list, what they're eating and, uh, you know, what are they putting in their in their mouth and, and the GI system and how open are they? And if somebody, you know, I feel would not benefit from uh, complementary therapy uh, to begin with, then, of course, I go with uh, the, the more chemical and prescriptive pathway. So with that being said, I feel that uh, patients are waking up to what's out there. They are hungry and thirsty for more, more answers. They do have more questions as well. So I think a modern day physician, nurse practitioner, we should be ready to open up our toolbox and say, okay, what do you want? I want to add to that because I could imagine some listeners to this thinking these guys have just gone off the rails with this discussion. Um, uh, and, and I might have thought that too uh, a few years ago, but but um, there's a whole new movement that physics is the new biology. Uh, you can actually look this up. I mean, there's really interesting research looking at the ab initio cause. I had a little bit of Latin there, but like the foundational cause of many of our disorders comes down to the few laws of physics that govern our existence, gravity, electromagnetism, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force. So these, this is physics. And, and every, part, every molecule in our body, every strand of our body evolved to manage the physics that we're exposed to. And so we're, we're starting to figure this stuff out. In, in December uh, coming up, I'm going to have a paper that explores the effects of gravity on the human body and what goes wrong when we don't manage gravity well. And I'll just throw this out there for a second. There's one thing that causes gut feelings in all humans, all humans, okay? Um, it's falling, literally falling, going down a hill on a roller coaster, turbulence, falling in love too, by the way, metaphorical falls, but falling causes gut feelings, but rising doesn't. What is it about falling that causes our guts to light up? as an alarm system it's almost like it's almost like we ha like ibs in a way is a neurovisceral fear of falling and it's not just neurovisceral it's vi it's not just neuro it's visceral too our body systems are fighting gravity too so that sounds nuts if i'm listening to myself but um i'm becoming increasingly convinced as like a scientist who has nih funded etc that there is real work to be done in this space in understanding the physics of, uh, of our existence, literally neuropsychologically and physically, and the integration of all of those. So we've gone off the rails a little bit, um, <laughs> Craig, so I'll bring it back to you and we can talk about more pragmatic things like what do we dose and how do we treat and what diet and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. But, but I, I'm with you there, Raj. Uh, it's, it's, it's not nuts, actually. Not that, you, not that I'm saying you're nuts. <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, I don't think so at all. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's where the world needs to go. It needs to be individualized. Um, and, and actually, a lot of the questions that we got uh, from the audience uh, were, were not necessarily uh, chemical based. To, to your point, Raj, a, a lot of them were uh, very much more premised around uh, dietary approaches to IBS. There were some questions around uh, alternative uh, dietary approaches that are not low FODMAP, but, you know, obviously low FODMAP kind of... Um, steals the dialogue a lot of the time, but there's, there's of course, some others, there's uh, the specific carbohydrate diet and others. So um, Raj, I think maybe you might be the best to, 
to jump that one off. Um, if, if we uh, transition the conversation maybe a little bit to alternative approaches using diet as a means to address the functional GI patient, um, anything that you've seen work, not work, um, anything that you're particularly interested in from a research perspective? Absolutely. You know, I, 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 I got to say the reason I became a GI doctor is because I love to eat and cook. I mean, my mom had to chase me out of the kitchen when I was a young kid. She's like, get out of the kitchen. You're always eating. So, <laughs> so that's the reason I'm big into diet and, uh, you know, uh, the food molecules before I do anything else. So uh, so uh, in, in terms of diet, I, low FODMAP diet is very restrictive, very restrictive. I mean, good luck trying to eat anything. So what I have seen in my experience, which again, like I said, you know, I'm going to say this again, you know, having gone to med school in India, having grown up in India has given me such a perspective on other anti-inflammatory molecules you can add to your diet. So with that being said, you know, I always start with having the patients avoid the most common trigger, which they can put the finger on. So that being, you know, milk or lactose, or, or those extra pumps of uh, syrup when you go to Starbucks or Dunky Donuts. Again, no endorsements here, but those, those you know, the polyols, the sugar alcohols, those artificial sweeteners. I always try to take a very focused history on the most common culprits. If I see there are triggers out there, I have the patient avoid them and they, they like it. A lot of my patients, they actually respond very well to avoiding garlic and onions in the diet. So if I don't want to go fully gung-ho restrictive, like you can't eat nothing. I always tell them, listen, okay, just avoid garlic and onion in your diet. And I want to say about half of the patients feel better just with that. Maybe there's a part of placebo to that, the fact that they're, they're watching the diet is helping, but it, it has helped quite a bit. And recently I have gotten into, uh, and I've used this quite a bit, mostly because patients are asking for it themselves. Uh, some people, they're asking for uh, uh, other options for protein. So I have suggested to them chickpea powder. Chickpeas are gluten-free. And again, it's a big part of Indian diet, big part of Mediterranean diet. So chickpea powder, chickpeas per se, boiled, et cetera, or cooked or sauteed in some spices like uh, you can say fennel and mint and a touch of salt and cumin. All And uh, not, to forget my, my, not to forget my favorite, which is turmeric. Turmeric is huge. I mean... Actually, one of the world's experts in turmeric is my family friend. And 20 years ago, he was at our house having dinner. And he's like, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Turmeric is going to be the next big thing. I thought he was joking, but he was right. He, he actually was a guy who was the main person behind the turmeric movement in the U.S. and looking at the scientific evidence behind turmeric being anti-inflammatory. So I have patients that are requesting Eastern recipes. And with my experience as well, I've been offering them to patients. So some of my patients have switched their diet where they've added chickpeas or peas with some turmeric, some herbs, which are gluten-free, farmland free and just clean eating. And they are, it's working for them. So that's one thing that works for me quite a bit. And then I have also uh, used quite a bit of, uh, uh, you know, a probiotic approach as well. Probiotics along with uh, uh, food enzymes. Uh, food enzymes, you know, I feel they have not been studied properly so far. I do feel they deserve some extra focus. But in complementary medicine, I have used uh, food enzymes and probiotics for a lot of my patients, and especially for gas. Gas responds very well to food enzymes. And there's multiple brands out there, and they're available some on, you know, on some common platforms. But as long as you have a good quality product that's, you know, Certified GMO, gluten-free, soy-free, nut-free, allergen-free, if it's super clean. And if it's a food enzyme, I have had good experience with that with my patients. And then for probiotics too, I have my go-to probiotics as well. One thing I always lecture my patients very aggressively is don't go for something which is cheap because yes, you're going to buy cheap stuff, but then you're going to get other garbage that comes with it. So it's very critical to read the label. So I'm actually educating my patient quite a bit on reading the labels very carefully and making sure that the probiotic they are taking to treat the concurrent IBS is not causing irritable gut syndrome because of the extra magnesium stearate or gluten or polyols, et cetera, that come with it. 
So I think that's where the education approach is critical. You got to teach your patients to read the labels and apply some type of a logic to the food molecules they're intaking. And also alcohol. I know there's, you know, people love wine and wine is good for you, says who the winemakers from Napa, things like that. But personally, alcohol is up for discussion in my, in my mind. Anybody who comes to me and they're drinking wine every night or a whiskey or beer every night, I make it a point to say, listen, zero alcohol, please. I feel that's a big step we must take because we all know alcohol is a cell poison. It, it is a mitotic, I mean, it, it's going to, it's affect your mitochondria and it can affect the epithelium too. So I always want to make sure that not only we are stopping the social things they're doing, like, you know, extra pumps of syrup in, in their mochas at Starbucks, et cetera, but also things which have been socially acceptable in the Western world and now becoming acceptable in the Eastern world, such as using more alcohol than drinking water, I feel we curb that too, especially when we are going through a game plan with the patient, because you want to make sure your playing field is super clean. If you think, if you're going to paint a painting, you're going to make sure you get a clean whiteboard and you want to have no variables that can affect your outcomes because that will affect your success and the satisfaction overall. Oh, really insightful. And I, I, I appreciate that. It makes a, a ton of sense. And that, covered uh, a, a few of the questions we got uh, pre-submitted, uh, things like digestive enzymes and uh, selective use of, of probiotics, dietary approaches. And uh, it looks like we actually have a few comments coming in uh, now to the comment box along those those same lines. So thank you for that, Dr. Sharma. That's that very, very helpful. And um, Dr. Damianos, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn that one uh, over to you, kind of same question, and then we can we can round it off to, to get Dr. Spiegel's thoughts. But um, any specific approaches to to diet um, outside of, of low FODMAP and, and then uh, getting a little more granular than that, uh, specifically, di you know, digestive enzymes or uh, any preference on probiotics, whether it's misbiome mm -hmm. or or cultural mm -hmm. or uh, espolarity, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. Yeah, absolutely. So starting with diet, there was a lot of focus last year's ACG uh, on the low FODMAP diet and kind of refining that a, a little bit more because uh, the low FODMAP diet really, as we discussed, it can be extremely restrictive and is often prescribed inappropriately. Really the only appropriate way is for patients who are screened against specific risk factors for eating disorders like ARFID, patients who are motivated to work closely with a re registered dietitian and complete all three phases, the third of which, which is the reintroduction and personalization phase uh, to liberalize the diet as, as much as possible. So that's, that's one important point to make. A second is that it seems, and this again might tie into the disaccharidase deficiencies, but there tends to be disproportionate representations of what actually bothers people among all the different types of FODMAPs. And so it seems that lactose and uh, a lot of people say they're they're bothered by gluten and it may actually be the fructans that are in, in gluten containing foods that are bothering them. And so this sort of FODMAP light approach of restrict, restricting the most common culprits can be helpful, particularly in, in times when you don't have readily accessible a registered dietitian to work closely with. Additionally, there was talk last year uh, of the Mediterranean diet, and, and this touches on some of what Dr. Sharma was mentioning of anti-inflammatory diets, the Mediterranean diet being a, a well-known one, and IBS patients actually prefer the Mediterranean diet compared to the low FODMAP diet, which is, again, no surprise to us, there, there's more variety there. Now, to speak to probiotics, as you mentioned in, in my intro, I'm part of the Alliance for Education on, on Probiotics, and I, I actually see that the uh, head of AE ProBio, Dragana Skokovic sunik is, is here uh, uh, as, a part, uh, as an attendee as well, um, which is great. And I, I really want to um, highlight AE ProBio for everyone who is interested in learning more about probiotics and selecting probiotic strains and mixes of strains based on the best available evidence. So one of the things that the AE ProBio does is, is sits down every year and creates essentially a probiotic prescribing guide. There's currently one for the United States and one for Canada. There's a website, there's an app, and uh, we, we very 
clearly delineate which brands of probiotics have good evidence for particular conditions. And because what a lot of people unfortunately do is, is they'll either dismiss all of probiotics due to the many limitations of the probiotics literature, or they'll say, oh, you know, take any, any probiotic. And I always flip that around to people and say, you need to think of probiotics like any other medication, for instance, an antibiotic. Each antibiotic has a different spectrum of activity against particular bugs. And similarly, each probiotic and, and mix of, of probiotics exerts different effects. And so we need to, when we're recommending probiotics to patients, pair the strains and mixes of strains with the best available evidence we have for that particular condition. And using resources like the AE ProBios guide, uh, we also, in collaboration with the Twitter's GI Journal Club, wrote a crowdsourced clinical review on probiotic selection and IBS. And so that's something that's on the website as well. And so for those of you who are interested, I highly recommend that you look at the AE ProBio website. There are a lot of really great resources about learning about the probiotics probiotics field, how to interpret the literature and specific recommendations for a, a wide variety of conditions. No, it's a tremendously interesting perspective. I, I appreciate those insights. I think uh, that comparison to antibiotics and, and it being, uh, you know, a very individualized approach in many cases, they're localized, but, uh, you know, each one does something different, different based on, you know, biofeedback and the like. So, uh, Really, really insightful. Uh, Dr. Spiegel, I, I will uh, turn it over to you. Kind of same same question. We have some really good questions in the chat box. I think we've gotten to uh, a few of these, but um, a few were specific to uh, Dr. Sharma. Some of your comments around enzymes and, and probiotic products. Uh, and uh, we also have a question from an attendee uh, around the benefit of turmeric uh, directly on the intestinal mucosa without regard to consuming fat and pepper to enhance absorption. Uh, are there any other benefits directly to the intestine uh, is, is the question generally around turmeric. And then there are uh, a few other questions around recommendations for probiotic use after a SIBO diagnosis. So um, Dr. Spiegel, maybe I'll, I'll open it up to you generally for comments there. And then yeah, Dr. I'll make a few general comments and I'll see uh, if uh, Dr. Raj, I know he's really Dr. Sharma, but we call him Dr. Raj um, <laughs> has some particular thoughts about the turmeric in particular, but uh, just, a few resources, to, uh, one resource to know about, uh, particularly if you do plan to use the low FODMAP diet, which as we heard can be restrictive and there are some limitations to it, but can be very effective in the right patient. Um, several years ago, Bill Che at the University of Michigan and I created a website. Um, it's a free website. It's called My GI Nutrition. So mygi-nutrition.com. And um, this is a resource to help patients navigate the low FODMAP diet. It was developed with, uh, from our team and Bill's team, also um, uh, dietitians uh, at the University of Michigan. And it's got a set of really helpful videos and uh, a guide for patients both to uh, go through the diet and also uh, often just, if not more important, to um, come off of the diet. Uh, so that's often the part that we don't talk a lot about is how to slowly, you know, come off of the diet and find out which of the FODMAPs, if any, is the culprit. Uh, so that's one thing to think about. Uh, I'll also say that uh, kiwi fruit, I don't think we've talked a lot about that, uh, particularly for constipation. There's some pretty reasonable evidence uh, also from University of Michigan. Um, and Bill Che and uh, um, Dr. Swarin have done some work looking at kiwi fruit for managing um, constipation and found some benefits. Uh, it wasn't an overwhelmingly positive study, but there were some interesting signals in there, enough for me to suggest it to patients because, you know, who doesn't like kiwi? At least I don't, I like kiwi. Um, okay. My son doesn't like kiwi, so he, he won't be able to use it. But uh, And then uh, this whole thing about uh, sucrase isomaltase deficiency in particular mm. is really interesting. Again, talking about Bill Che, who I guess we need on this call because he's yeah. done a lot of this work we're talking about he's really pushed this, this narrative based upon data that we may be missing a lot of these patients. And, and we heard a little bit about the ACG work recently. Uh, I have started to test a little bit more frequently for sucrase isomaltase deficiency. Uh, I had a patient just recently, um, about 30, 33 years old, a uh, younger man, years and years of abdominal pain and, and bloating and diarrhea, and absolutely nothing really worked for him. Uh, he had been diagnosed with IBS, told it was stress, 
But when I talked to the guy, he didn't seem stressed to me really too much at all. He was a pretty even keeled guy that, you know, I was like, no, I don't think this is stress. And long story short, I tested for him. He had like 0% activity uh, and I didn't even believe it. I repeated it again, 0%. And um, just started with uh, an elimination diet and he got almost entirely better, like within days of starting that diet. Now there are some enzyme supplements that are quite expensive that you can look at that are interesting. Uh, but this is again, another example uh, where we have to think about some of these, you know, key entities we never thought about before. Uh, and just because we didn't think about them before, doesn't mean we shouldn't think about them now. And this whole idea of IBS being a diagnosis uh, of inclusion rather than exclusion, it's still a tough one. It's still a tough one because um, the Rome criteria continue to em sort of emphasize it's a diagnosis to be made proactively, which I do believe, but mm -hmm. at the same time, man, there's some, there's some things lurking underneath that we can miss if we don't look for them. So in terms of the specific questions about turmeric and et cetera, maybe I'll turn that over to Dr. Raj here, who may have more to say and educate us on, uh, on some of these um, dietary suggestions. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Raj, if, if, if you want to take us home here, I know we're, uh, we're running up against time. Uh, okay, yeah. I want to be respectful of, of that, but uh, yeah. So some of these, some of these questions, uh, Dr. Damian, you, you were uh, very, very helpful. Uh, AE Pro Bio, I believe was, was the name of the organization. And we can share that with the group afterward. But one of the, the questions was around probiotic use in IBS and uh, patients using probiotics indiscriminately and GI mm -hmm. guidelines being a little bit unclear. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this attendee said they're stuck in the middle somewhat. Um, any comments from the, the panel would be appreciated. So I think maybe that would be the, the first resource, uh, offered up if, if any of the panels have other resources that that they'd like to offer relative to uh, pre or probiotic use by all means. And um, then Raj, I'll, I'll turn it over to you uh, for the, the turmeric question. Sure. And if I can just briefly uh, touch on uh, probiotics and SIBO, since that did come up, uh, this is a question that does come up very, very frequently. And uh, there really is no convincing data at this point that probiotics help with SIBO. And in fact, SIBO is, is frequently a reflection of underlying small bowel dysmotility. And so there's even the possibility of precipitating or worsening SIBO by, by basically pumping the small bowel with uh, with a bunch of bacteria. And so I, I uh, always encourage people to uh, look for the underlying precipitators and contributors to SIBO uh, and caution against probiotic use, especially when there is that dysmotility. Very, very helpful. I appreciate that. I knocked off a few of the questions. The, the other uh, SIBO related question was, do you see problems giving probiotics orally, especially after treating SIBO, as opposed to needing to give uh, probiotics rectally? Yeah, and I would I would say the same thing. I I really um, and there's even uh, there have been a few studies that have suggested a link between SIBO, probiotics, and brain fog. And and the studies haven't been so clear that that implicates that's that says, for instance, probiotics are the cause of the SIBO and the brain fog, and, and kind of the the causational arrows aren't particularly clear at this point. Um, but I, 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 as part of AE ProBio, I use probiotics for a lot of different GI indications. I do not use them for SIBO, again, because of that uh, dysmotility component and the risk of, of having the SIBO recur because I'm pumping their small bowel with a bunch of bacteria. Excellent. No, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Raj, do you want to take us home here? So the, the two questions for you specifically um, are, uh, what are Dr. Sharma's favorite enzymes and probiotic products? And then the next is, please explain the benefit of turmeric on directly uh, the intestinal mucosa without regard to consuming fat and pepper to enhance absorption. Great. Again, wonderful question, and I wish I had two hours for that, but I'm gonna make it. <laughs> I'm gonna make it efficient. Maybe we can do a separate webinar just on that. You uh, got it. So you know, since the turmeric's been around for thousands of years, I'm gonna answer the number two first. Turmeric's been around for thousands of years. Actually, if you go to PubMed, there's tons of published data about turmeric being anti-TNF. So it's an anti-inflammatory molecule. And in, in Indian culture, we actually use turmeric anytime we have joint pains or cold and flu, we 
put turmeric in uh, almond milk or milk or tea and we drink it. And as it goes in, it gives a systemic anti-inflammatory effect. Now, coming back to the GI tract directly, it, there's a big mis, uh, I want to say misunderstanding amongst people that Indian food is spicy, always going to be hot. No, it depends on your tolerance. You can make it severe spicy or you just have enough for the health benefit. And turmeric itself is not spicy. If you take turmeric in excessive amount, it could irritate your, your gastric lining and make you nauseous because it's just chemical irritation. But if you just take even one fourth teaspoon, a high quality, uh, a non-GMO, high quality turmeric, one fourth or even one tenth teaspoon in water, almond milk, anything you prefer, it's going to go inside the GI tract and it's going to give you anti-inflammatory benefits. So I've used turmeric quite a bit in my patients with, uh, with, with Crohn's and even UC where they just don't know what to eat and they're looking for anything which will help them with this IBS type of uh, overlay to their IBD. So I've used turmeric in those patients quite a bit. Some of them like pills, but if you use pills, you have to make sure that the, that the lining of the capsule does not have gluten or polyols in it. So you have to ensure it's high quality. I personally love powders, okay? That's the best. Now, if patient's looking for a recipe, a simple recipe, which I recommend a lot of my patients, is just white meat, like chicken, white, and you can just stir fry that in, in olive oil, put a little pinch of turmeric on it, maybe some salt, and if you want a black pepper, that's it. Now, you got your protein, you got anti-inflammatory molecules, you got olive oil, which is healthy as well. So like combination of Indian food with Mediterranean food. So, so I actually, in my book, I have a lot of recipes which I created, and we'll be making videos very soon as well, which will be on my channel to stream. Okay, so that's number one. You know, I want to say more, but I got I have no time left. Number two, my, my food enzymes, there, there's a company called uh, Metagenics, and Metagenics has a brand, it's called Spectrazyme. Spectra Zyme. And if you go there, it's a mixture of amylase, lipase, cellulase. You know, the one benefit which I'm jealous of a little bit in animals is they have cellulase. So they can break down cellulose and be okay. We don't have cellulase. I feel that has a big role in our issues as well. So I feel that when we add cellulase to a diet as well, it can help with gas and bloating quite a bit. So if you look up the enzyme Spectrozyme, it lists many other enzymes in there as well, which could benefit people quite a bit. With regards to probiotics, the one which I like the most is called Visbiome. I actually take it myself as well. I just take it for, you know, just to, you know, to look good. Uh, and uh, it, it has a good balance of uh, every microbe you want to have. And it's pretty good. And my patients have good, good experience with, uh, with probiotics. I had one patient one time with IBS. I tried everything on her, everything. I mean, I mean I'm very stubborn. I did not give up. I tried everything. Finally, I put her on uh, a Visbiome. And boy, her pain just disappeared. And, and there was a distinct measurement of the rise in pain if she did not take the probiotic. So she takes it. It works for her. I'm not going to caution it. It works. So these are my go-to, some of the tools I rely on apart from everything else I do. Well, that was a, a very effective and efficient answer in, in two minutes, what you said you would have liked two hours to to give the answer to. So thank you. Thank you for that. I know we're out of time, but uh, for those that are interested, I, there was a comment earlier about n wanting to know what causes the SIBO before just sort of blindly treating it. Uh, and in I can't type into the... Uh, into the chat. So I put it into one of the answers to the questions. How I The checklist I go through happens to spell out dysmotility, which is one of the causes of, uh, of uh, bacterial overgrowth. And those spell out the individual things that I go through in my checklist to, before I just start randomly treating people. So a little uh, heuristic to help uh, our acronym to help some of our clinicians perhaps. That's great. No, thank you very much for that, Brennan. Um, and thank you to to all of our panelists. This was a tremendously insightful and fascinating conversation. I will uh, turn it over to you, Jason. I know we're running up against time here, and we will make sure that we uh, share and circulate all of the the takeaways and some of these these links here in the message board, um, as well as uh, yeah, certainly, Brennan, your breakdown um, underlying costs of SIBO here. Uh, I'm I'm reading is tre tremendously helpful. So thank you for that, and uh, thank you to everyone for being here.